Sutra, the Buddha said to Ananda, there are cultivators in the world who, although they realize the nine successive stages of Samadhi, do not achieve the extinction of outflows or become a house, all because they are attached to birth and death, false thinking and mistake it for what is truly real. That is why now, although you are greatly learned, you have not realized the accomplishments of sagehood. Commentary, the Buddha said to Ananda, the Buddha saw that everyone was fidgeting and practically beside themselves, not knowing what to do. They had all lost their minds. In Mencius, Confucius says, in, uh, says of the mind, is going out and coming in, have no fixed time, and its location is unknown. Just that is called the mind. I don't know what time it leaves. I don't know, you don't know what time it leaves, you don't know when it returns, and you don't know where it went. Probably that is the mind. However, the mind Confucius speaks of is also the false thinking mind, not the true mind. How could the true mind go out and enter? It doesn't have any exits or entrances. Mencius also said, when a person shrinks and does get loose, he knows he should go look for them. But when his mind escapes, he doesn't know that he should search for it. Here too, he is talking about the mind which strikes up false thoughts from morning to night, running east, running west, running back and forth. He doesn't know enough to watch over his own mind, to tell it not to run down so many roads in vain. I have said your false thinking mind allows you to be in New York in the space of a thought with no need to spend money on an airplane or train ticket, and you can play on the Brooklyn Bridge without bothering to take a bus. It's really a cheap way to travel, but it is a tremendous exertion for the mind. That is what it says in mentions about the conscious mind, the mind that Ananda is familiar with. The conscious mind is impermanent. The true mind is permanent. There are cultivators in the world who, although they realize the nine successive stages of Samadhi, the nine successive stages of Samadhi are the first, second, third, and fourth stages of Dhyana, the four places of emptiness. The place of heaven about this emptiness, the place of heaven about this consciousness, the place of heaven of nothing whatsoever, the place of the heaven of neither thought nor no thought, and the samadhi of the extinction of feeling and thought, they do not achieve the extinction of outflows or become our hearts, all because they are attached to birth and death of false thinking. Why do they cultivate and achieve the nine successive stages of samadhi and yet cannot obtain the penetration of the extinction of outflows and accomplish a hardship? It is because they are attached to false thinking of birth and death and mistake it for what is truly real. They make the mistake of taking that false thinking to be true. That is why now, although you are greatly learned, you have not realized the, the accomplishment of sagehood. By this time, Ananda had reached the first stage of hardship. So why does the Buddha say nevertheless that despite the advantages that come with erudition, Ananda hasn't realized the accomplishment of sagehood. The Buddha means Ananda has not obtained the penetration of the extinction of outflows. He is not devoid of outflows. In the small vehicle, the first stage of ahatrip is considered to be level of sagehood, but among bodhisattvas, it is not. Sutra Ananda repents and seeks the truth. Chapter 6 Sutra When Ananda heard that, he again wept sorrowfully, placed his five limbs on the ground, knelt on both knees, put his palms together, and said to the Buddha, Since I followed the Buddha and left home, what I have done is to rely on the Buddha's awesome spirit. I have often thought, there is no reason for me to toy at cultivation, expecting that the Sadhakata would bestow samadhi upon me. I never realized that he could not stand in for me in body and mind. 
Thus, I lost my original mind, and also my body has left the home life. My mind has not entered the way. I am like the poor son who renounced his father and ran around. Commentary: The Buddha has said that because Ananda was obstructed by his learning, he had not realized sagehood. He had neglected samadhi and concentrated on acquiring erudition. When Ananda heard that, he again wept sorrowfully. Why did he cry? He realized he had been wasting his time, and the fact that he had not attained sagehood was truly pitiful. So he burst into tears. Then, too, the Buddha had instructed him about his true mind, and feeling very grateful to the Buddha for that, he was moved to tears. He placed his five limbs on the ground. Ananda then placed his hands, feet, and head on the ground. After he bowed deeply this way, he did not rise but knelt on both knees, put his palms together, and said to the Buddha, "Ananda was crying and talking at the same time." Like a child who goes out to play and gets beaten up, and runs crying home to his parents to tell how he's been bullied. Now it is as if Ananda had taken a beating. What kind of beating? He's lost his basic frame of reference, as he explains it. Since I followed the Buddha and left home, what I have done is to rely on the Buddha's awesome spirit. Ananda was the Buddha's attendant, doing such things. As helping straighten the Buddha's robe when he ascends the high seat, he left home. But as I mentioned before, one can leave the worldly home, the home of the three realms, and the home of affliction. And Ananda had left only the worldly home; he still hadn't left the other two. Now Ananda confesses that, although he has left home and bowed to the Buddha as his teacher, he still hasn't changed his way of thinking. What was that? He relied on the Buddha's awesome virtue. He thought, as I have the Buddha for a cousin, who else in the whole world has the Buddha for a cousin? He was extremely arrogant. He thought he had something both powerful and influential to depend on. He relied on the Buddha's awesome virtue and spiritual penetrations. I have often thought there is no reason for me to toil at cultivation, expecting that the Tathagata would bestow samadhi upon me. He thought to himself, "I have the Buddha for a cousin. I don't have to cultivate. I don't have to go through the bitterness and suffering of cultivation. Why not? Because my cousin had become a Buddha. Why should I have to cultivate? The Buddha can give me samadhi power." Ananda thought it was necessary for one to cultivate samadhi power oneself. The Buddha could just give it to him. Think it over. Isn't that naive? I never realized that he could not stand in for me in body and mind. Ananda says, "I believe that none of us could think like that. We all know that one cannot stand in for another for another." But Ananda says that he really didn't know that the Buddha's body is the Buddha's, and his body was his body, and that the Buddha's mind is the Buddha's mind, and his mind was his mind. We cannot substitute for one another. The Buddha cannot represent Ananda in body and mind, and he cannot represent the Buddha in body and mind. He didn't know that he himself had to cultivate samadhi power. Thus, I lost. My original mind. Because of that, I took a great loss. Ananda admits. And also, my body has left the home life. That is, he has become a monk. My mind has not entered the way. That is, he has not obtained samadhi power. I am like the poor son who renounced his father and ran around. Ananda is referring, by way of analogy. To the case of an extremely wealthy elder who enjoyed many blessings, he had a son who didn't make use of his father's assets, but went out into the world to suffer poverty. What Ananda means is, I followed the Buddha to leave home, but I didn't cultivate the way because I lack samadhi power. I'm a poor son. Actually, I could have taken on the Buddha's family business, but. 
without any samadhi power, I still don't have the authority to receive the Dharma, the Dharma which is a master as a result of the Buddha's merit and virtue. So Ananda stopped grievously, just like a child. Sutra. Therefore, today I realize that although I am greatly learned, if I do not cultivate, it is the same as if I had not learned anything. Just as someone who only speaks of food will never get full. Commentary. Therefore, today I realize, I just now realize this, I did not know before. Although I am greatly learned, if I do not cultivate, it is the same as if I had not learned anything. If I simply know a lot of things but don't put them into practice, I will be like a stone man who can talk but not act. In other words, Ananda could remember things he was widely learned and had a good memory, but he had no skill, no kung fu, when he came to actual practice. He had never actually done it. If he does not put his learning into practice, it is the same as if he didn't know anything at all. Just as someone who only speaks of food will never get full, it's like someone who continually talks about things to eat. For instance, people who like vegetarian food say, let's make vegetarian dumplings, they are really good. Or let's make oil cakes, as they do in Manchuria, they are even better. Those who eat meat say, such and such a Chinese restaurant is the best in town. The food there is real, really good. The food there is really good. Let's go have Chinese food. Americans like to eat Chinese food. So they discuss the various dishes by name, but just speaking about them and never getting around to eating them is no way to get full. There's another saying, Every day you count others' money, but not half a cent of it is yours. Not cultivating in accord with the Dharma amounts to the same thing. It doesn't matter what Dharmas you know. If you don't cultivate the way that's being the same as someone who counts other people's money, you have no share in it. If you don't actually go and cultivate, there will be no result from your efforts. Sutra, World Honored One, now we all are bound by two obstructions and as a consequence, do not perceive the still, eternal nature of the mind. I only hope the Tathagata will take pity on us poor and destitute ones and disclose the wonderful bright mind and open, open my way I. Commentary, Ananda again called World Honored One. Now we all are bound by two obstructions. Every one of us in the Great Assembly is tied up by two obstructions. The first is the obstacle of affliction. The second is the obstacle of what is known. The obstacle of affliction arises with the attachment to self. The obstacle of what is known arises with the attachment to dramas. As to the obstacle of what is known, if you think, I know a lot, that is an obstruction. It is not that the more people study things, the more their knowledge increases. Rather, the more they study, the more they are obstructed by what they know. How is knowledge an obstruction? It makes people arrogant. Take a look at me. I know things that none of you know. I am way beyond you. I can't even compare to you. All of you are ignorant, but as for me, why? My learning ability stands second, so none in this world. It is rare even in the heavens, how much the less, how much the less can it be found on earth? As soon as that arrogance arises, it is the obstruction of what is known. With the attachment to self comes the obstructions of afflictions. No matter what comes up, you cannot see through it. You cannot let it go, and so you become attached to it, and once the attachment arises, the affliction follows right along. That's the obstruction of affliction. These are the two kinds of obstructions which Ananda says have bound up the members of the Great Assembly. Bound means that they have not attained liberation. They cannot get free because they have these two kinds of obstructions. As and as a consequence, do not perceive the still, 
eternal nature of the mind, I don't know the tranquil, unmoving, permanently abiding nature of my mind. Now, because I do not understand this doctrine, I only hope the Tathagata will take pity on us poor and destitute ones and disclose the wonderful bright mind and open my way I. Pity me, pity me. He is still relying on the Buddha. He is still not standing on his own. Poor and destitute means they have not obtained the drama wealth of the Suragama Samadhi. Another wants the Buddha to take pity on him and show him the wonderful bright true mind and cause him to soon open his way eye so that his wisdom can increase and he can accomplish Buddha, uh, sagehood. The essential thing is to accomplish sagehood. Sutra Then from the character one signifying my red virtues on his chest, the Tathagata put forth a precious light, radiant with hundreds of thousands of colors, the brilliant light simultaneously simultaneously pervaded everywhere throughout the ten directions to the Buddha realms, as many as the fine most of dust anointing the crowds of every Tathagata in all the jeweled Buddha lands of the ten directions, then it swept back to Ananda and all in the Great Assembly. Commentary Earlier in the Sutra, the Buddha emitted light from his face, a blazing light as brilliant as a hundred thousand suns. What did it represent? It represented the breaking up of the false, the false thinking mind. Now he again emits light, this time from the insignia one, my rat, on his chest. It represents the disclosing of the true, the true mind. Then from the character one signifying my rat virtues on his chest, the Tathagata poured forth precious light. You can see the character one on Buddha images. It represents the adornment of the Mindrat virtues, since the Buddha's virtuous practices have attained perfection. Radiant with hundreds of thousands of colors, the brilliant light simultaneously pervaded everywhere throughout the ten directions. So Buddha realms as many as the fine most of dust. The character one put forth precious light which radiated back and forth. It was an eerie it right sense shimmering light with hundreds of thousands of colors and it shone back and forth pervading not only the Saha world but all the Buddha lands simultaneously. Then it anointed the crowds of every Tathagata in all the jeweled Buddha lands of the ten directions. It illumined the crowds of Buddhas in as many Buddha countries as there are fine most of dust. It was as if the crowds reflected one another's light. Then it swept back to Ananda and all in the Great Assembly. After it illumined the Tathagatas of the Ten Directions, the Buddha's light returned and illumined Ananda's crown and the crowds of all the great Bodhisattvas, great Ahas, great Bishos, the King, the Officials, and the Elder in the Dharma Assembly. The Buddha emitted this kind of light as a sign to make everyone understand the pure nature and bright substance of the permanently dwelling true mind. Sutra and said to Ananda, I will now erect the great Dharma banner for you to cause all living beings in the ten directions to obtain the wondrous subtle secret, the pure nature, the bright mind, and to attain the pure eye. Commentary and said to Ananda, I will now erect the great Dharma banner for you to cause all living beings in the ten directions to obtain the wonderful, wondrous subtle secret. The Buddha said to Ananda, referring to himself as I, I will host a great Dharma banner not only for your sake but for the sake of all living beings in the ten directions so that they may obtain the most extremely wonderful and infinitely subtle cause that is the secret cause mentioned in the title of the sutra. It is secret because it is not known to most people before the Buddha has pointed it out to them, just like a vein of gold which has not been discovered by geologists. 
Most people don't know it is there once the gold is discovered. Once the geologists arrive at the spot, investigate it, and realize there is a deposit of gold there, then it can be mined. The secret cause is the same way. I will cause you to obtain the pure nature, the bright mind, and to attain the pure eye. The nature is pure and clear, the mind is luminous. Because your nature is pure and your mind bright, you attain the pure eye, which is the way eye that Ananda has just asked the Buddha to open for him. It is also called the wisdom eye. Pure means to be free of even the slightest defilement. It indicates that the vision of the wisdom eye sees the principles very clearly and truly. If you have the pure eye, you will be unobstructed and able to understand any principle.